This episode of the podcast is supported by Bentley Lewis, an award-winning executive search firm. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. We are proud to be official media partners of Dive In Festival 2019 this year, which is really cool. And we're doing a series of podcasts for the festival. And if you don't know, uh, the F- Dive In Festival is a global movement in the insurance sector, which is supporting the development of inclusive work place cultures so really really cool work they're in their fifth year they're in about 33 countries now so they do these really cool um, events panel discussions uh, all over the world really helping to promote diversity and inclusion which is very cool Today I had the amazing Pauline Miller come in to speak and this was one of my favorite conversations I've had she's got a super inspiring story and great views on diversity and inclusion leadership and all of those good things and we had a really good conversation she is the head of talent development and inclusion at lloyds of london and one of the driving forces behind the dive in festival hope you enjoy it hey it's lewis welcome to the podcast enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere cool and we're live pauline Thank you very much for coming in. No problem. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So um, before, well, I'm really looking forward to speaking on all things diversity and inclusion with you, (laughs) which would be really cool. But before we dive into that, um, I'd be interested to hear about your story and how you've got to where you've got to and doing the cool things you are. What I love about my stories is that people always say, how did you get into HR? And I say, well, actually, when I was 14 years of age, I went off and did my work experience like many of us do, you yeah. know, a couple of weeks um, in, a, in a department, in an office, stuff in envelopes. And mine was in the HR department of the oh. London Stock Exchange. Oh, wow. And when I left, I thought, I want to work in HR. And so um, slightly diverted tour, but I ended up in a HR department after a stint in IT. And I was in the Training de- uh, department. So I, my role then was to be uh, very much in the talent development space and working with, at the time, an investment bank um, in ta- in development and developing people. And was this straight after school or? Uh, after university. After uni. So you grew up in London? I did grow up in London, yeah. I was born outside of London, but I grew up in London. Cool. And, um, and so I um, did my London, my work experience. Yeah. I went off to college, I uh, went off to university. Um, I had uh, a, a, two children along the way. Oh, cool. Um, one before I left school. Um, and, uh, and then, um, and, but straight through university and straight into a training role, wow. but for an IT firm. So you did, uh, you had, you did uni while you had a kid as well. Amazing. Yeah, I had one before. I I had one at school, carried him into uni, got pregnant in my second year with my daughter, wow. graduated, went straight into a graduate training role. Amazing. <laughs> How did you cope with, uh, I barely coped with uni, let alone looking after, <laughs> <laughs> look after two. And it, you, you went to university in, in London? Yes, I did. I went to Greenwich University. Nice, um, nice. And I studied uh, business administration, majoring in personnel, as it was called back then, nice. uh, because I had my, my sort of goal and I think what happened for me was that um, I knew what I wanted to do and the children just had to come along on the journey with me yeah so um, must have made you super organized and I'm not sure if I was super organized but super focused so being really focused on what it was that I wanted to do what I wanted to get to Um, and actually when when I was at school university was the option that's what I was going to be doing so you know yes I got pregnant but actually I still had university as that long sort of you know that forward goal that goal you always so I think you know it's, it's really important we give young people that chance to see what their goal is because it doesn't matter if something comes along and steers you off path as long as you know what direction you're heading you can continue on in that in, in that way no, definitely that's good advice because just things happen in life yeah absolutely you know, um, and nature and- no one story is the same and so we've just got to learn what's the road that we're on and sometimes there'll be a few bumps along the way so um, so I always say to you know my children have grown up having to live with you know <laughs> a HR mum um, and one that focuses on um, diversity and inclusion um, yeah. which I switched to after about eight, eight, or, eight or nine years in um, in my first few roles okay. um, I transitioned within from an investment banking division into the wealth division of the firm I was at and okay. moved into a diversity role 
Fine. And what was the what was the reason for wanting to to kind of focus more on diversity and inclusion? You know, I so um, I, I I had a great friend in the investment banking side who was working in diversity at the time. Uh, back in two thousand and five, I was sent to New York, and you know I always talk about sort of certain managers, different points of your career. And when I was with um, when I was in the investment bank, this particular manager came up to me and said, "We need somebody to go to New York. I think you'd be the right person." And I said, "You know, when do you want me to go?" And he said, "Tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> now you know why was he great because he didn't look and say oh you know she's got two children she's a single mum she couldn't possibly travel to New York short notice now I, I said give me half an hour and I'll let you know and I said look I can't go tomorrow but I can go the day after um, and nice. pack the children up sent them to my mother's um, wow. you know and, and off I went to New York on a undetermined um, length of time and whilst I was there I got involved with the diversity groups that were out there oh, okay. and when I got back I thought you know what my passion has got to be to move into the DNI space full time yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to working with networks and I'd run some networks and I'd been involved in the networks in London when I got into New York I knew that that's where I wanted to switch over to so I came awesome. back and sought out a DNI role amazing amazing <laughs> What was, what was kind of your biggest challenge going through all of that that journey? Oh, um, you know, I I was working in, I worked for a media agency, a strategic media agency before the investment bank. And I thought that was tough in terms of the hours. And investment banking right, yeah. is a tough industry. Um, and it was back then. Um, yeah. So I, I would say that in those, those periods when the children were younger and you're trying to juggle all of those things um so you're trying to juggle home life you're trying to work you know very long days or picking up work in the evenings it's really difficult to fit all of those things in and you know i think it's great now that we've got um, a better recognition of how important it is to balance work life um yeah, and yeah. how important it is to take care of our own well-being but it is it, back then for me it was a huge stretch yeah. to be a single mum and you know have a five-year-old daughter and trying to work in a long you know in a long hours uh, environment yeah um, i didn't have like uh, flexible working and all that stuff back then or? no um <laughs> I, I recall having a dialogue once when i was when, in fact i was shifting firms and i i needed to work from home for a day to get the handover notes prepared and i remember my boss saying to me at the time could you um could you not tell anyone else in the department <laughs> in case it creates a, a demand for yeah. home working yeah. um you know but we were laptop users so you know just crazy. you still do it if you yeah. want to yeah so um I, I think now you know i work from home quite flexibly um and i think we see more and more of that and i it's think we've got to embrace now. it yeah no definitely yeah <laughs> and what, what does dni mean to you exactly um you know i think it's really interesting because for me diversity is all about for me diversity is all about how different people have different aspects of their lives that we don't know about and we don't appreciate and we don't value so some people look at me and think oh she's a woman some people will go she's a black woman some people will know that I've got most people know I've got children um some people will go oh she was a teenage mum I'm all of those things I'm not one thing and I think that that for me is what diversity is really about we are a multitude of different things and we've got to learn to value that and so the inclusion aspect of that is ensuring that people feel valued and engaged and in the work context that they can come into work and feel that they can deliver their absolute best and be appreciated for it. So I think, so for me, it's about recognising individuals and it's about how do we make sure we um, appreciate those and create that fairness for all. Yeah. How have you seen it change over the years? Oh, it's gone from... When you started doing that, it must have been... When I of... started, it was very um, siloed in terms of diversity groups. So it was very much a, you do something for the women, something for the... Uh, um, LGBT community and actually back then there was a lot of more focus on LGB and not the T right. um, something for the ethnic minorities but typically they were separated out into their own groups oh, right. um, I think what we're seeing now is and I, I'm not necessarily one to use the words I'm not really all about the intersectionality which is the big buzzword I'm much more about what we see is is that groups that are working together recognising that they have multi multi aspects to themselves yeah. and that actually they don't want to just be talking to themselves what they really want is to be able to talk to 
different people um, to either educate, to partner with, and to support each other. And let's be yeah, honest, yeah. the world is much more diverse now oh, and yeah. much more complex Definitely. than it ever has been before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And London, I mean, it's fantastically diverse. Oh, I love London. Um, but, you know, we have pockets of London where, it, where you don't see that diversity in the same way. So you don't true. see the blend yeah. and the mix. And that's true. Sometimes I think that's what, you know, is part of the cause around the social challenges that we have as well. Well, you have, you know, you have like people like people like themselves yes you know and say you know i'm jewish and you know when the jews came we all lived in the same area together and it's the same for other Mm. other immigrants and stuff absolutely but that's the cool thing but then in the city you have this massive oh yeah everyone comes together and you have this like massive melting pot and blend of different people and And i think that's 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 the key is that you know you see it in the city and i think we've got to embrace more of that especially in in our big in our big city hubs so london manchester birmingham we've got to be able to make sure that we're bringing all of the communities in that we're engaging different communities bringing them together and that we're um, recognising that there's a value to that as much as we see outside of our offices we need to do that inside as well no definitely and so you're seeing you're seeing then that a lot of the um, the organisations that are trying to promote diversity for the LGBT for mm-hmm. female etc I'm, I'm all coming together now because over the last I don't know let's say five ten years as you mentioned they've all been quite siloed yeah and I think you know you're starting to see it but you still see You still see a lot of of organisations kind of trying to organise events and networking for that specific So I think what you tend to find is that the... So mostly in organisations, you tend to find that those individual groups are organising events um, themselves. So it's grassroots led. Um, And yes, organisations are supporting it through resources and funding, etc. But it typically is is that these are groups that that enjoy coming together, either through support... Um, you know, they they have a connection with each other. I, you know, it could it may not be an obvious one. Um, you know, that's always the one people always think that. You know, if you're going to go along to the LGBT group, they must all be in the LGBT community. Well, actually, it could be that they're parents of children who yeah. are LGBT, or it could be that they they are just truly a supporter of equality. It really varies, but they they may organise an event that they feel is of interest to people who are like minded. Yeah. And I think that's what we tend to find, and why we still see those events and I don't think there's anything wrong with networking and engaging with people that you have a bond with a connection with that you share similar interests with that's the yeah, human nature definitely and have you seen have you seen it improve a lot since you've been working in DNI? <laughs> like are we are we in quite a good spot right am now am I out of the London? job yet <laughs> no never never <laughs> well, but are, we, are we like you know is it I mean I mean it feels London you know London's a pretty good spot to live and work so I think we are I think there have been improvements I I it would be wrong to say that we haven't seen progression in the diversity and inclusion space over the last 10 to 15 years. I think what I would say is that there are still areas where we are woefully behind. Um, you know, if I took disability, for example, that space is huge. Um, the, you know, uh, the number of people that have a disability, you know, we typically think that people were born with disabilities and that's not the case. Um, most people acquire their disability and when they acquire their disability, within a year they tend to find themselves not in the working environment so I think it's really important for us to recognize that whilst we've made progress in some areas um, and there is still more to do so in all of the areas it's a spectrum and in all of the areas we're on that journey and some of them we've made greater strides because um, I'd say because it's an easier one to start with um, and that's what organizations tell me and when I'm talking to be it HRDs or CEOs they they often say well you know we're starting with gender uh, because we can work on because because we know who the women are we know we can work on that we're really worried about asking questions about any of the other areas right. so we'll start with women some firms have taken the approach that they'll work on and focus on women and that will then filter through but the reality is is that we need to understand the challenges that individual groups are facing so be it those with a disability be it here in mobility or etc um the, the, what we find with disability for example is that there is a uh, progression of focus or a more a great to focus actually around mental health and well-being yeah, because yeah. we know that that touches and has to touch every single person so even if you feel that you are absolutely great that's because you've got good well-being right now but the reality is is that at some point in our life we'll all experience you know sort of 
of less a lower level of well-being yeah, yeah and so that's why you know again one of those big areas that organizations recognize can impact just about everyone so yeah, yeah. that's what we've got to we've got to move the dial on some of those areas that definitely are, are not seen if, if you're in like um because i think i think just over half of people work in in mid-size or smaller firms mm-hmm. and the, the great thing about a big firm is you have all of these re- wonderful resources mm-hmm. and all of these great things going on what can do you think like small smes are doing enough yeah. or what, what can they do with the re- limited resources that they have do you know i had a great dialogue yesterday where we were talking exactly about that with our chairman and we were talking about the fact that um that in small organizations uh it's really difficult for them to say well we're a firm of 10 <laughs> you know we're a firm of 10 we all feel really engaged but how are we going to diversify and these targets aren't going to work for us so you know we we i see that um and what i often say to small organizations is we're not expecting you to go out and set up a network for your 10 employees <laughs> yeah. you know we don't i wouldn't encourage you to do that um what i would encourage you to do though is to partner with others so um, engage with other organizations that are of a similar size um, you can help to provide so if you're an organization an SME you've got um, some women in the organization but the management team is all male for example and you're trying to find a way to engage them partner up with others find senior women if that's if that's what they say you know I don't have a role model they don't have to come from within your firm true they yeah. can be there are role models up and down the city there are individuals that are doing amazing things that can be translated back into the business Um, you can encourage people to further their career with opportunities as a school governor for example to gain the board skills that will position them for future roles in your own organization so there are different ways you've just got to think creatively um, but you've got to be willing to do it yeah and also the employee as well needs to seek some of this stuff out oh yeah i mean it's so easy to sit back and say well my my employer doesn't do anything yeah. for me you've got to you've got to be wanting that as you well you know it's a two-way yeah. dialogue employment is a two-way contract it's yeah. both the employer and the employee and you know career progression development opportunities um you know putting your hand up for roles you've got to be able to do that as well as have great managers that will reach out to you. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah. We see, you see seeing a lot of discrimination in the workplace. Has it got better over time, do you think? I think it, I think it depends on the industries that you're in. Um, so I think uh, some organisations, some, some industries have progressed a lot further than um, because they started this journey earlier. And yeah. if you think discrimination started out in that sort of, you know, very much it was all, all about, you know, or diversity and inclusion was very much about equality. So it was all about legislation and making sure we comply with the law before it moved into this diversity space, inclusion. And you can take all of the words, you know, now it's belonging. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, there's this, what, so there's this well, array of progress. And that's what I think it's showing. I think it's showing us that we have progressed from just focusing on law to, you know, really thinking about how people feel and belong in their organisations. That said... Um, some organisations started earlier and, and sectors started yeah. earlier so you've seen more progression in, in, in those areas there True. Um, I think you know I'm, I'm in the insurance sector so you know we've started a slightly delayed pace yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know women only entered into the Lloyds building in the 70s Crazy. so you, you, that just sets the tone and shows you that it took yeah. a lot longer for us to move the dial I think from a in terms of discrimination I, don't, I think that there are pockets where people will still feel that they have not had the same access to opportunities as other um, peers in their organisations yeah. and we have to understand what's what's driving that and a lot of the times it's because we haven't thought about how decisions are made in the process so have we looked at um, bias that's involved in our recruitment process so where we attract our candidates from where how we how we interview them and yeah. how we make those selection decisions um, and have we put the processes behind that to make sure that we are removing any forms of inequality and imbalance in processes like that so yeah. and I think we we have started to see that we um, implemented in my own firm we implemented mandatory training um, for those in the recruitment process Brilliant. so if you are going to recruit you must have an accredited recruiter in that process uh, right um, and we've t- and those accredited recruiters have gone through training that talks about not just the interview and how to ask a good question but how to write a job description so it doesn't use words yeah. like strong and bold yeah. 
board, oh. which may only attract certain candidates. True. No, that's true. Interesting. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I see it all the time. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a headhunter. And it's funny, you, you go in and see clients, insurance, banking, whatever, and they they always say, I mean, the sector experience is super high on so many people's lists. Mm. And, and certainly in insurance, and you find they're all fishing in the same pool. Yes. Um, and, and when you ask them, you know, well, why is it important? You know, how come? Trying to open up the... You know, it, it's it's a bit of a battle. So I find that quite and interesting. And I think we we recognise that there that the the world is changing and the way that business is performed is changing, and the you know the um, the advancements of digital and different entrants to the market. So you know, if we don't adapt um, the t- the way that we do our business, which requires people with different skill sets, um, we will fail because yeah. there are competitors and other sectors knocking on the door ready to get involved in the insurance sector so we we're in that mode of having to make sure that we diversify the talent that we have the skills that are in and coming into the talent no definitely i mean even like the really cool techie digital people i mean i don't think you have to wear a tie at the lloyd's building anymore which is a great step forward yep I think a friend of uh, a friend of ours, Josh, wears slippers. Yes, he does. Which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Love Josh. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, but it's true, you know, if you turn up to an interview and, you know, so the people sitting in front of you are like super smart and you're just like, don't identify with, with you know, it's very hard to take a job there and see Absolutely. yourself working there. I like to think that I'm the most colourful person walking through the underwriting room Absolutely. on a daily basis. <laughs> um, and But it is it is very much, we, we, we encourage people to dress according to their own organisation because, of course, we have lots of companies yep. working in. But, you know, it's quite interesting because culture deems that people do, you, you know, I do go in the underwriting room and see people with a jacket on yeah, yeah. and their suit and their tie and actually I'm sure if when they get back to their own offices they probably take the jacket off and take the tie off True. so yeah. it takes time to shift cultures and shift yeah. attitudes but I think you know by removing the dress codes um, and encouraging people to dress for their diary that's true um, as well as yeah. opposed to you know anything else so rather than giving them pres- a prescriptive dress yeah. code just dress for your diary yeah if your firm allows it i mean if you are seeing more it. now that are i think we're seeing more we yeah. have that in place we dress yeah. for our diary um yeah. at lloyd's and we flex um according to our day so yeah so, that's yeah. important so do you feel that you can really be yourself at, at work with these recent changes i think and- i i think that i've probably been myself at work for a little while and that's probably because when you're in the diversity and inclusion space the, the only thing you can be as is as authentic as possible yeah. and so i have people who come and seek me out regularly and you know I had a conversation with an individual who was uh, saying that you know they felt that they they would need to you know um, dampen down their personality and I said well you know what (laughs) don't do that you are going to struggle to interact with people if you are yeah. suppressing your natural you, you know your natural Spirit and, yeah. so you know I said I, I absolutely am as bubbly as I am I pick my environments um, particularly to where I believe that I will be able to deliver the best and where I can continue to enjoy and progress my career now if I don't think I'm a match I'm probably not going to go there yeah that's fine yeah, yeah. Uh, and most people wouldn't necessarily think that going to Lloyd's was a match for the bubbly black girl from London <laughs> um, but actually uh, I I know that I am confident enough that my experience and knowledge and skills is exactly what I'm offering them yeah. and that and that I don't need to change any part of my personality um obviously in different situations I'm engaging at different levels yeah. so yeah. you know when I'm talking to CEOs I'm just as bubbly but I'm very careful to listen to what they're saying so that I can make the points that they you know that I need to get across yeah and that they're looking to hear so, um I think that's just me How, and what about so what, what are the barriers for people feeling the same as you so this this guy or girl who mm-hmm. you know what, what was the what's the thing that stops them what I um you know said to that individual was it's really important to just be open and to listen to people one of the things that we don't tend to do often enough is to allow people the opportunity to um, make mistakes and to learn uh, and and just you know so I always say I'm a black girl black woman I like to define myself as that and people will hear me talk about that all the time now in this wonderfully modern and complex world that we live in people aren't really sure if they should use the word black so they get slightly muddled up and should I use BAME or should I 
you something else. Is it minority or person of colour, which is a really common use of words in yeah. the US. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so I like, uh, you know, I will say, actually, I, I prefer to be referred to, if you're going to define me by my colour and by my ethnicity, I prefer you to say black woman. Now, first time, it's okay. I give you permission to make that mistake. I give you permission a couple of times over. Um, but eventually, you're and not listening starts to know, and you're yeah. ignorant. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think we've got to give people permission to make some mistakes. And, and it's really tough because it can be really personal for people. So we've got to be able to give people permission. Um, but people have got to listen as well. So True. if we're inquisitive and we explore in the right way at the right time, it's not just a, look, I need you to tell me all about you. I need to hear <laughs> everything from you top to bottom. Um, <laughs> that, that isn't the way. No. But the more that we break down those barriers and the more that we break down the stereotype, that it will enable us to break down those stereotypes. It will enable us to be yeah. broader in our thinking and understanding. Not everybody will have had dinner with a black person when they were growing up. Think of it like that. The likelihood is, is that everyone will have had some connection to, if you're a man, to a woman, to a woman, to a man. So it's yeah. about how do you create those in those pieces? Yeah, And that's a two way. It's two ways. It's got to be got a two to way be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely. And what changes would you like to see in the workplace that can can maybe facilitate these conversations more? You know, if people are awkward, not quite mm-hmm. sure what to say, but want to, you know, strike so up a friendship. I think it's multifaceted. I think organisations have an opportunity to be able to provide some of that information so they can um, recognise different days, different weeks, make it informative and, inf- and, and informational for people to broaden their understanding and their knowledge yeah. um i think at the same time individuals can be inquisitive and can go out and search for that yeah. i'm not suggesting people do what i do i go visit I, you know i'll go visit a temple i'll go, <laughs> go visit a church or you know you I'll come go, to my I, synagogue next. I'll, I'll come to the synagogue <laughs> um i literally um you know i'm happy to go out and explore because i'm inquisitive i'm not suggesting that but you can yeah. find out about these things through simple resources and online. Yes. Now that's at one level. That's just basic understanding. Organisations also have the ability to um, formalise in a more structured approach people's roles when it comes to broadening, um, you know, engaging with, um, you know, either being a mentor or um, offering uh, to sponsor somebody if you're a senior leader. Yeah, um, yeah. So they, they have the ability to put the processes and some of those more formalised programmes in place yeah. as well to help those from less advantaged or underrepresented groups in their firms. Yeah. Um, at the leadership level, you absolutely need to stand by your morals and you need to really be able to drive that through because what we tend to find is that at the very top they do tend to be committed and at the very bottom people are very engaged and the huge range in the middle it varies and so leadership need to be able to say this is important and we're going to drive that down the processes and the structures around how we work how we what we recognize what we we uh, reward um, through compensation for example needs to enable people to take that inquisitive space to take the information that's offered and then to be able to create the opportunities for people for everyone to progress and develop and the people doing that companies doing that well now not all of them (laughs) um those that have been on it a little bit longer um but you can look at some of the data points and we know that there are still some huge challenges in terms of whether it's ethnic minorities progressing into senior leadership levels and having opportunities whether it is um the lack of women in in senior roles or the impact that taking time out of their work has had in terms of their earning potential and growth potential we see that through the gender pay gap reporting although Though it's a fairly volatile measure because yeah, it's on it's one great. day yeah. but we can see if you took a snapshot that actually that's all that's showing is a snapshot in time but actually the impact of those career breaks now how can an organization address that they can't do that right now they're not going to change it yeah. in the in the immediate but one of the things that we've done at lloyd's is we have not equalized our um, family care benefits so however you start a family whether that's through adoption surrogacy right. whether you're male female it, however so do men men get the same six months full pay really awesome yes. Six months full pay. It's rare. Male and female. Adopters, whether it's through IVF, 
um, we will give you six months. And those 26 weeks are then, if you take a straight 26 weeks, we'll then give you an additional four weeks phased return to enable you to settle back into the office because whether you're male or female, you will have had a six month break from work. Yeah. So that- And, and what's, been, what's the take up been for men? Do you know, when we announced the policy and we did that in um, this year, it went live in April. The, the, so we ran some drop-in sessions so right. that people could come and ask questions. Yeah. Uh, all of the people that came were men. Interesting. Yeah, because <laughs> it doesn't feel like okay to stick your hand up as a guy and say, hey, I'm off for six months. Mm -hmm. It's a um, weird one. But. Do you know, I, I was in our Chatham office um, a couple of weeks ago and uh, there was a guy who was going to become a parent and he was so <laughs> excited about the fact that he was going to be out for six months. Yeah. So our next stage is to talk about that. Um, is to talk about the fact that actually, and, and men don't always take six months. It's an option. They may take two or three. But what happens when managers are thinking about opportunities, subconsciously, unconsciously, you know, it's way back. It's almost a, might they take a period out? Or, you know, now it's equal. Yeah. You don't know who's going to take six no, months out. But it's interesting because the person deciding to take six months off will be thinking, is it going to have an effect on my career? Mm -hmm. And we know it does. Mm hmm but it's, it's interesting. Now now the decision is, is for men and women. The decision is for men and women. It's um, and, and actually, if all of the men... Uh, so I, I typically find at the moment, I think, we have had some take the full six. Um, you know, we, Do they have to not, share it? Can they... No, we don't. We, we, um, so they can be off with their wife? It's an independent... Yeah. yeah, it's an individual um, benefit for them, regardless of what their parent, uh, what their partner Part is doing. Um, Love that. But yeah, so so that, but that normalises. Yes, and yeah. that will take time to filter into the organisation. So we only launched it in April. We haven't had our first full six month yet. Yep. But what we would expect to see is that a more equal and even blend of individuals starting to take longer periods of time. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one of the things that we've done. Amazing, I love that. <laughs> Mo moving back onto, onto leadership, because yeah. you, you, you find people really struggle to get their first leadership role. Yes. Um, Maybe whether they're looking for role models or mm -hmm. just thinking about how to do it and what skills to develop. How, how would you, what would you recommend that, that people focus on and what traits do you think they need to? So first of all, in your role, um, whatever you do, you've got to be brilliant. Yeah, you got to yeah. you got to know your stuff. You got to you know because that's essential. That's your fundamental basic. That's the knowledge and the skills that you have to deliver in a role. Um, but the areas that um, we tend to look for in leaders is very much about their visions uh, and how they can look at you know sort of you know much bigger picture, understand what that vision is, and be able to communicate that vision. Um, it's really important for leaders to be able to inspire others, um, but most importantly, they've got to be authentic. So yeah. I would often say. You you know, it's really important that you understand who you are as an individual. You know, what do you stand for? What are the things that you stand out with? Um, think about what your career looks like. What's what's the future plan for your career? I know what my future plan is. Um, and I've been doing that for the last 15 or so years, really thinking about what's the what's the next role going to look like? And what are the things that I need to have those in, yeah. that, in that role? And there are really simple ways, you know, it can be really tough to find a role model. Yeah. yeah. So if you yeah. if you can't find a role model start with what's the type of job that I think is the next leadership job I'm looking for what's the job description look like what are they asking for now can I start to see any of that that's transferable in maybe the roles that I see that are maybe you know other people in my organization so if it says that they're looking for a great communicator you know you've got to be able to communicate with impact as an example you might then say okay so communicate with impact do I have the opportunity to communicate and how could I get that opportunity it doesn't always have to come from within an organization True. Yeah. you know if it's and as I said I was a school governor for 10 years and I was chair of governors for about eight and a half years so um, you know I sit back and think well I've sat on a governing body I now understand strongly budgets um, that developed my skills around financial management to help me when I became a head of function so yeah, yeah. I think it's things like that that you can do to help you progress into leadership like take some ownership of your career and absolutely yeah. Yeah. even sports and it's you know. sports a great opportunity yeah. um, you know I, I, I as I said I was a governor I also sit on an advisory board for a movement within the UN foundation called Girl Up um, and that was a you know coincident in yeah. coincidence in terms of how I got there. I've been on. The but board. you've put yourself out there. Put yourself out there. These opportunities have come. You've taken them and. 
taken them and also integrated them into my workplace. So, yeah. you know, yeah. my in my last firm and this firm, they have both sent me off to Girl Up Summits. I've been to Ethiopia, Washington, New York. Wow. Um, and what is it exactly? So Girl Up is a movement of engaging young girls around the world to um, advocate and champion for gender equality. You know, we take girls, sort of early teens, they learn about the challenges of gender equality. They go out and advocate in their communities. They raise awareness, they raise money and sponsorship. Um, Supporting girls in Malawi, for example, with bicycles so they can get to school or supporting girls in school in Ethiopia. It's an amazing movement and I've never seen so much passion in the young Girl, in the girls that we engage with and they go right up you know into their early 20s they take that all through university and I think what's great with Girl Up is that we are creating the next generation of future female leaders um, and they will all walk away knowing how important it is for gender equality around the world brilliant Mm. Amazing, and you've been to all the, you've been to these different countries. And... So I've been there. I, so I took a trip to Ethiopia to um, oh. a few years ago to meet the girls, some of the girls in the refugee camps. And when I got there, so I arrived in Addis Ababa Airport, and I was sitting in the airport waiting for the US team to come along, and it was just me right. waiting, yeah. waiting for them. And I and I was sitting there thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> this immediate lack of confidence that like oh, I have just disappeared. It was like I I. Didn't, don't know anything about the plight of these girls. I don't know anything about Ethiopia. I don't know anything about refugee camps. I've got the <laughs> briefing pack and I'm sitting in this airport. And oh, and by the way, there's like a TV star coming, people who work <laughs> at the UN Foundation, and girls who are younger than me who have been advocates for years. What? I'm an imposter. And that's what I thought at the time. And it took a couple of days for me. So we'd gone from Addis Ababa. We went down to uh, Jijiga, uh, where they have some refugee. There are a number of refugee camps. There were three. We visited um, two refugee camps while we were there. And in one of those refugee camps, we we were in um, somebody's home. It was a mum. She had a number of children, seven children. She had walked days to get to Ethiopia and um, and we were asked um, the us as the contingent visiting yeah. sitting on the floor in her home to just introduce ourselves and say a few words and everybody was talking and you know they're doing their piece and then it got to me and I was like I have no idea what to say <laughs> but I looked at her and what we had been talking about before was um, two of her girls that had opted to go out to not go to school and she was a uh, relatively young same age as me and I looked at her and said I understand and I know what it's like to be a mum that wants the best for your children and I know that you know you had your your children are um, young and they're 13 14 15 and then I looked at the girls and said at your age I had a child and you can do you know you look at me now and think oh she's you know this wonderfully big executive from a firm I said I was a teenage mum. I had a child at 15. And at that point, it was almost the, I get my purpose. My purpose was to go out and be able to talk about the work that those, that the organisation does, but also that actually we can still achieve. You can still drive forward. You still have that chance. So, um, I came back from there and it, you know, it, life I, changing, you know yeah. yeah, it was, it was yeah. life changing, but it just strengthened the work that I was already doing. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm honored to be able to go out and work with the girl up organization and we do a summit here in London now as well. We're Amazing. heading to our second summit in October. So awesome. I love that. That's yeah. great. <laughs> and dive in festival as well. I mean, you're busy. Oh yes. Oh yes. We are busy. So um, <laughs> what are you, uh, what are you looking forward to this year? With Ooh, dive in. So dive in. Um, this year's our fifth year. And, and you've been involved from right from the beginning. Yeah. So um, I, um, I I signed my contract, and about um, about two weeks later, someone said, "So we're going to do this diversity week, like a festival." And I joined in the June, so I was able to um, be involved in the early sort of some of the earlier meetings, a couple of meetings in the run up to me joining, and then I attended some of the meetings with the culture group that was sort of pulled together to put on the events. For right. the day around culture so I was watching from the side um, in okay. the first year uh, and I uh, but I was uh, and I was probably the only one in the first year that went to about 
um, 17 out of the 18 events. <laughs> right. So I just, like, right. I just started, better go to everything. Better go to everything, <laughs> see what this is. Yeah. Um, and the second year I said, you know, if we're going to do this again, it's got to be global because diversity is not just about London. I took that proposal, I took it global and uh, we're in 30 countries um, more than 30 countries this year, more than 60 cities Amazing. Um, in countries like Bahrain and Nigeria, as well as locations that have been on this journey and have done a, just as an amazing job as the as the London and, and UK teams, Australia and the US are huge dive-in festivals. Yeah. In one instance, I'm excited for that. But in London particularly, there are um, a couple of big points for me. I think the first is the partnership with the launch dinner at the Bank of England nice. that will be hosted in early September. And for me, that is, um, you know, the very fact that we've been able to get such a great institution. Uh, we've got a number of CEOs and key stakeholders coming along to discuss what more needs to be done for our sector around diversity and inclusion. And that's a pivotal moment for us. Brilliant. Um, I am always um, excited for the closing night. Yeah. Um, our closing night this year will be will be a comedy night. Uh, we've done it before. Uh, we took a break last year because right. we had Lenny Henry come. Oh, nice. Um, nice. And uh, <laughs> it's still comedy, but it was Lenny. Um, <laughs> and uh, but this year we'll have um, we've gone back to our comedy fest. And uh, I'm so excited because it is just Amazing. a way to sit back and enjoy, yeah. um, you know, the end of three days. Um, our opening event will be very special with Sir yeah. Trevor MacDonald. I yeah, yeah. wanted to get him last year and we couldn't and uh, really delighted that he'll be there this year. Brilliant. There are amazing... You've got Frank Bruno. We've got Frank Bruno talking about mental well-being. Yeah, we'll have yeah. Ben Cohen talking about bullying. You know, we've got some really brilliant speakers, but we've also got some really specific topics, you know, yeah. looking at things like um, fertility and looking at things like domestic violence because diversity is so broad. We didn't just want to go down the simple lenses. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a really big piece for us as well. Um, and then the final um, event that I'm really excited for is that in November, we will be hosting a dinner oh, nice. to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Dive In in London. Brilliant. And uh, what we'll be doing, and this is an exclusive just for you, <laughs> is we'll be having an award ceremony as part of that, oh. um, a part of that journey. And so... It's the first time you've done it. It's the first time. Uh, we may not do it again. Um, wow. The idea is, is that people will be able to buy tickets. Yeah. The money raised will go to the charities that have helped us over the five years. So there are Love some it. great charities that have come in and, you know, given their time for free whiz kids um yeah. p3 diversity role models you know have all come in and you know they've been speakers etc we would like to give something back so oh, what great. we'd like to do is to um have a have a fabulous evening have some fun but also recognize those charities that have supported us in this journey because we couldn't have done it without the charities we couldn't have done it without the sponsors the organizations that have got behind this yeah. offered resources and most importantly the volunteers that have put the events together amazing that's lovely. Well, what a great, a great place to end. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming in. I'm really looking forward to the event. And um, congratulations on all the great work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.